Kristen Duquette, welcome to Trace and Global on Wheels podcast series. I'm so happy to have you join us. She is she has worked for President Barack Obama, spoken at the United Nations headquarters, and represented the United States on the U.S. Paralympic swim team. Kristen is a five-time American Paralympic record holder three-time junior national record holder and the former captain of the U.S. Paralympic swim team for the 2010 Greek Open. Kristen is currently an analyst inside FEMA's Transit Security Grant Program with its mission to prevent and mitigate terrorist attacks for transit systems. In addition, Kristen is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for FEMA's Women's Forum. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much, Ming, for having me on. I'm so excited. Our first question is, be, I think I'm... listeners are probably unfamiliar with the specific strand of mm-hmm. muscular dystrophy that, that you have, and um, could you just describe that? Absolutely. Yeah, me? absolutely. Um, so there are 40 different types of muscular dystrophy. Um, I have a type called FSHD, which stands for fascio-scapular humeral dystrophy. And I was diagnosed when I was nine on the week of my birthday. It is not life-threatening in the sense that it impacts my involuntary muscles, such as my heart or breathing capacity in that way. Um... But that being said, as the full name of the condition itself, it primarily affects uh, voluntary muscles in my face, uh, my shoulders, my scapular region, my upper arms. And also because I was diagnosed as a child, um, I have this condition a bit more severe uh, with the genetic expression that it has on my body. So with that being said, I no longer stand or walk because it has affected different portions of my legs, uh, my ankles, my feet, um, my back. I have lordosis, or I used to when I was standing and walking for a bit. Um, And I recently had to stop walking uh, when I was 25. What kind of wheelchair do you use? I use... Uh, an electric scooter. It's a go-go elite. It's a pretty tiny chair compared to all the other very cool devices that we have in today's society. And is it prone to any specific kind of malfunction? Oh gosh. (laughs) Um, I mean, the number one thing that I uh, can send my anxiety for a loop is if my battery is being drained. Um, uh, you know, it has a few different speeds, just like a car. And if your foot was on a pedal, depending on the pressure, um, uh, but for this chair, it's obviously with your thumb and, uh, the forward or reverse functions, um, it can go to turtle mode or full speed rabbit mode, like a lawnmower, as I would think of it. Um, the number one thing is, the uh, all of a sudden if the battery is going out that's that I actually have had a few times where I've just been praying away to just like cross Pennsylvania Avenue without it stopping in the middle of the street um I do have a charger on me at all times because situations like that have happened so Um, I also have a backup chair that's charged at all times next let's move on to fitness so why is staying fit um, important for individuals with disabilities? Oh, gosh. Do we have the time? Uh, (laughs) I mean, oh, gosh. You know, we could dive into statistics. We could dive into different data that there is. Um, I'm not saying that there's a lot, but there is, about if you become sedentary, what that does to your body. And I think that there's kind of this struggle between seeing that in a sense of having disability in a medical model sense versus a social sense. Um, 
I think being physical is a choice, being physically active. Um, but maybe that alludes to how society generally sees that if you are physically disabled, that kind of means not that you're not active, but that you shouldn't necessarily take pride in your body. And I see being physically active as a way to take pride in my body in my physical sense, uh, despite general uh, norms of having pressure to think otherwise. In a medical sense, we know that, you know, it's so beneficial for you. It's, it's so great for your heart, your blood circulation, for your mental health, for your emotional health, for, you know, someone like me, for my muscles. I know in a personal sense, um, being physical, uh, physically active, uh, since there is no treatment or cure for the specific kind of muscular dystrophy that I have, um, swimming keeps my condition relatively stable. So that's another reason why I have just always been in love in the water subconsciously also. Um, but I think going back to your main question, um, being physically active, I, I would love for disabled people to know that there's a certain level of confidence that you gain from being physically disabled and then also excelling very well or excelling at, at your own personal level in something physically active. And it's so beneficial for you to be able to take pride in your body and own your body in a way that society is not necessarily really outright telling you at this moment. But rather, whether that happens or not, you should at least own every part of your sense of self. And I think that uh, is definitely your body also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great answer. What are some exercises that people can do? So I know swimming is definitely one of them. How, how else do you try to stay fit? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes... I have such a, a crazy schedule that I try to at least swim once a week. And then if I swim more than once a week, I think I'm somehow training for the Paralympics again, which in reality, I ate like a burger and fries the night before and chocolate cake. Aside <laughs> from that, I do think that I come across this all the time, right? So I have a stationary leg cycle um, at my apartment where um, I think it was like $80 off of Amazon a while back, and I just hooked my legs up to it. It comes at various um, uh, degrees, and it has a timer, and I just cycle. So I, at least I can get um, aerobic exercise in. Then um, after all the years of training, um, and, and before I was training, I was going to physical therapy. After I trained, um, actually recently I pulled a, a tendon in my arm. And I had to go back to physical therapy, and um, I got back into the different kind of weights I could use, uh, the different bands, uh, the different stretches. Uh, so there's a lot that, you know, even someone in the kind of mobility stage that I'm in, there's doubt you can get very creative with, um, for instance, the I, I have different level bands. You could tie them into a door, a doorknob, and do arm rows and pull your arms back uh, and squeeze your shoulder blades together. Um, different things like that. It's definitely finding a professional that knows your body really well if you don't. And even if you do, right, I think I know my body very well. I've trained for years, and I still go to a professional here and there because sometimes it's so much easier it's and more safe to have a professional in front of you and see what you can do compared to what you mentally think that you can do and how far you can go, especially for someone also with my kind of personality that's very at times type A and, and pit bull like that I can take things on that I actually really cannot. Um, so I would say find a, a physical therapist or a trainer 
and see all the different fun little toys that you can buy and get and have a heyday of the different weights and, and things like that. But yeah, there's, um, I don't want to say, cause I don't want to say there's no excuse to not, uh, be physical. Um, because I, I definitely do think that there are barriers for various kinds of disabilities, but if you are someone that is seriously interested in trying something new, there are various avenues that you certainly can pursue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. One of the things I um, definitely agree with you is the stretch bands. Um, I, I use them um, not as often as I should, but the times that I have used them have been very helpful. Um, so going on to um, common areas where wheelchair users are injured. So so you said that the majority of wheelchair users would develop shoulder problems and yeah. carpal tunnel, elbow tendonitis. Have you yeah. experienced these issues? And if you have, how have you dealt with them? Yeah, so uh, the most major uh, injury that I had was an uh, irritated nerve in my neck that went straight into my right arm and made my right arm limp with uh, nerve shocks. Um, that was when I was training and I was act- it actually occurred because I was overtraining, which is something that uh, is, is something to be very cognizant of if you have muscular dystrophy, injuring yourself from overtraining and then having a hard time recovering from that. With the, uh, the uh, tendonitis, um, I have not had tendonitis. I believe I have not. What I recently had was the tendon that I pulled in my elbow um, in my left arm. And uh, the different exercises that I was given uh, by the physical therapist I saw at uh, George Washington Hospital was um, was uh, different uh, tendon exercises. So um, one and, and hands, wrists, and elbows essentially. Um, so like squeezing of a ball with um, on various levels uh, with my hands, uh, using different weights to do different wrist exercises on both of my hands. And then um, kind of this long noodle, I would say, that I would hold with both my hands and pull down and then pull back up. It's, it's a bit difficult to describe them, just audio. Um, but And then stretches also, so stretching my, my wrists and my forearms uh, back and forth. I think staying uh, loose and, and not tightening up, especially with my neck, is something that I definitely have to be mindful, and uh, that is what I would certainly pass along with our fellow uh, wheelchair users. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those are very helpful. Um, so I think we'll just cover this briefly now because it most relates to to the um, the topic of fitness um, more so than the other areas that we'll be covering later on. What should be changed about how beauty and sexuality is portrayed in the media regarding individuals with disabilities? Oh, Ming. We do not have time to tell, for me to say everything. Oh, gosh. Uh, this is something that I've been very passionate about for quite some time, uh, a few years. Um, I mean, especially in our media sense, I, I feel for anyone whether they're disabled or not, and they don't feel like they are being represented in mainstream media, or if they are, they're not being represented properly. Um, And as we know, for people with disabilities, if you are represented, it's probably portrayed by an able-bodied actor, 
um, what is the narrative. Um, and usually that character is described with struggling with their disability, um, such as the Me Before You movie, which I wanted to visibly get sick over when I watched it. Um, I, I also think in our beauty sense, as we recently saw in Vogue, Teen Vogue's uh, September issue, uh, there's more disabled models um, that we're showcasing in our fashion world. And we're also seeing that in the makeup industry too with um, people that have different tones of skin color um, all together. Uh, it's, it's gonna be hard. Um, it, I mean, it already is hard. It's going to be a process. I, I definitely believe that representation of all human forms matter. Um, but I think the way to do that, and maybe this is where our technology comes into play with social media and having a more active voice online or things like that can really showcase uh, women or men uh, with different disabilities doing really incredible things. Um, I think that is one of the great things that is making uh, the world a bit smaller if we want to talk about social media and, and technology and the internet and our cell phones. Um, but I do think that altogether our culture is slowly changing to be more represented. It's definitely not there. I'm not sure it will ever be perfect. I don't think it will. Uh, but as we can see, it is slowly changing. Mm -hmm. What shows have you seen that you feel like have done a particularly good job of portraying individuals with disabilities and portraying that specific disability in a very accurate manner? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, the film that I actually really liked a lot is, let me find it, um, the Netflix film, The Fundamentals of Caring, that Selena Gomez was in, the thing that I did not like about that film, though, was that the character that had Duchenne's, uh, I believe his name is Trevor, is actually an able-bodied actor. Now, if we take that aside, though, and just focus on the narrative, I actually, I thought it was great. Um, I didn't think it focused so much on his character being disabled. It really showcased his sense of humor and his sarcasm. And uh, having a personal care assistant with him, uh, that is, I, I really love that film a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed it too when I watched it. So why is it so important to you that they, they are not overpowering in the narrative with emphasizing um, the disability aspect? Because I think, <clears throat> I think film is a powerful tool, uh, is a power, powerful tool um, for subconscious advocacy or awakening people's minds that are not familiar with other uh, ways people live. I think it's great to showcase empathy on different ways uh, of a, a human existence. Um, just like how a book can, but I don't want people to see a film or see a TV show and think, oh, okay, that's how you talk to a disabled person, or, oh, okay, that's like, um, that's how the narratives usually are, um, and we, you can tie that into how narratives, dominant narratives in mainstream media outlets to other minority populations also uh, and that we all subconsciously carry. And I think it, that just comes down to, at least for me, my micro interactions with people is, you know, I don't off the bat like tell people what my disability is. That, they, I, I, that's none of their business, to be honest, because I see being disabled as an identity. So I hope in the future we see and continue to see uh, different films 
or TV shows of uh, disabled people, whether they have a major role or not. And it's actually like not at all about their disability. Um, that's just an aspect of who they are, right? I think that would be really incredible to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I understand what you mean. It's not necessarily um, about how we're ashamed of it. Right. Oh, or not, but it's about be letting people see more than our disability. Yes, we have a disability, but also we are human beings, and that uh, we have these different passions and the different interests. Um, that are just like the other the other groups of yeah. people. And you can be an awful person too. You could have an awful character. You could have an awful heart and be in a wheelchair. And God forbid, I really hate the narrative of overcoming or you're so inspiring for everything you've done for being in a chair or things like that. When in reality, it's how society is viewing you uh, that is making those stereotypes that much harder when you are just really just living your life. Um, so maybe one of these days there's going to be a film or... A TV show where there's a disabled character and they're just a really awful person. And it has nothing to do with what we've seen in past um, media outlets of villains that are disabled and they become so cold hearted because of their disability. No, they're just flat out like a jerk. Uh, can we just stick with that? Um, and that this is just another form of a human existence. Um, I think that would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no that would be great so you mentioned technology and social media a bit ago how is the importance of technology and social media different to disabled people versus able-bodied people you're really throwing out some great questions I you know if we talk about the, the, the political climate that we're in right I, I'm in downtown DC and it's like there's a protest going on almost every weekend um, depending on your disability you can't do those things um, and I think it's good to be mindful that advocacy takes all different shapes and forms in uh, for anything any cultural shift to ever really happen advocacy is a whole circle of effect so in the sense, in the space of technology and social media for disabled people, right? Like, um, you know, this past uh, 2018 Women's March, um, we had disabled people on the National Mall, but we were also, you know, contributing to uh, the different hashtags and trending issues online. Um, or... Uh, being able to easily access your congresswoman or senator online uh, because they're so we we forget that um, it it's a privilege to go outside in protest when there's people who physically cannot leave their home um, and that's why we still um, I'm so grateful and happy that we live in a country that has access of voting uh, and fully includes people that cannot leave their house. Um, or, you know, if we go back and talk about protests, there's people on the autism um, spectrum or with an emotional disability, and they just cannot be around that many people all at once. But you still want to contribute without feeling guilty or bad about yourself and how intricate you are made in your human form uh, to still contribute to these issues. So I don't think unless, and this goes back to, uh, you know, a belief that I've kind of always carried, I don't think able-bodied people really understand how incredible technology is in you know, in terms of social media. Also, uh, if you do not have someone disabled 
close to you in your life or you that you come across to really see and experience how this is such a connector and eye opener in uh, establishing human relationships uh, through technology. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually just received an email today by the nonprofit Respectability. Um, mm -hmm. They 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 work towards increasing employment for people with disabilities. Anyways, they say right. that seventy four percent disability affects seventy per seventy four percent of likely vote voters. And uh, the former representative and Dallas mayor Steve Bartlett said fully three quarters of likely vote voters either have a disability themselves or a family member or a close friend with disabilities. So it definitely makes. Yeah, and that, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I would, I would argue also that that statistic is probably a bit higher too because there's people that will probably not acknowledge that they identify as having a disability too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to um, leave room for margin of error. Next, let's move on to to disability rights advocacy. Um, I know. So you've done a lot of work in both local and national governments. I understand that you worked for. You're currently working for FEMA. You've worked for the D.C. government, Senate campaigns, Clinton Global Initiative, University, etc. And you've also had experiences outside of the government, such as the United Nations, being a writer and contributor for the Huffington Post, the, FA, uh, the FSH Society, the NCAA, American People of People with Disabilities, a scholar for Goldman Sachs. I can go on and on. <laughs> um, lots going on there. Could you give us like some tips of how you've managed to have such a rich and meaningful professional background within such a short time? Um, well, I actually don't sleep. I'm just kidding. I do. Um, you gotta be genuine. Um... And you have to rise above any kind of things that you will come across. I mean, there was one job that I was just stuffing envelopes. And I was like, I got uh, undergrad in human rights. And I did the intersectionality of disability at the UN. And I'm stuffing envelopes right now. You know, it's, it's not like everything is going to be sunshine and roses. That's for sure. Um, you... You gotta be able to be tough in the sense that there is always going to be a tomorrow. Um, and I say that because um, I, when I did not make the London 2012 team when I was 21 at the time, um, I had to be at least top 10 in the world to uh, even be considered for the team and to make the team. And I was 13th for an event that was not mine. And I remember being in that room and the team being announced. And all, although I knew that I wasn't going to make it, um, it was still gut-wrenching. And I felt like my heart sunk to the floor uh, over something that I trained for seven to eight years over. And I was holding back tears while seeing dear friends of mine that I knew put in so much work and effort to see their dream come true when I thought my dream was crushed and I had no clue how I was going to keep going. And I think it was a great lesson for me to realize that the, even when you think you failed, you probably haven't because at least you tried. I think so many people are held back by their doubt or their fear of, well, what if, what if this doesn't work out and all of this was for nothing? And I, I think whenever someone has said that, I say back to them, you know, your, your journey of uh, trying to achieve something is not wasted because there's always learning lessons that come out of that. So I think that, you know, thinking grand and really knowing that 
you're needed in this world, right? It's not that like, oh, I'll just kind of like slip by and, and do X, Y, Z. Um, no, you're, you're really meant to do something incredible. And that's only going to come from within yourself. Uh, I, yeah, I definitely a very type A, ambitious, stubborn, determined, strong-minded person. I mean, I retaught myself how to swim, um, just to have hopes to make my high school swim team, not to become a Paralympic hopeful. I only learned about the Paralympics from my high school swim coach once she learned how I spent a whole year reteaching myself how to swim. Um, I kind of set this mindset from a very young age, and I think this is because of how I was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy in nature and nurture, but, uh, and, and I have a great support system, but, uh, you go out and do it. And if you go and achieve what you set out to do, that's great. And if you don't, and you, you think you failed, but you gave it everything you got, that's still great, right? Like, who, who am I to say that someone's contributions to this world isn't worthy? It's not. We, we are all worthy. And I think that's something that I would want any young girl that's disabled to know that. That whether they see themselves on TV or not, they can really make an incredible impact. And you're always making an impact on every single person that you talk to also. It's not like I wake up every morning and I'm like, well, let me do X, Y, Z. Actually, uh, for a few years, I really thought for me to do something significant in my life and know that it's of value is to do something on a grand scale like what Nelson Mandela did and stopping an apartheid. And that's actually pretty sad to think that, right? And so I think that is the number one thing I would want anyone to walk away or roll away from is that you are contributing to this world uh, just by being who you are. Uh, stop trying so hard and just be present and, and see and listen to yourself, listen to your gut, listen to that inner dream that's talking to you and go for it. And you're going to be just fine. You really are. We talked about inspiration and being inspired a little bit earlier. What um, does it mean to be inspired for yourself? And then what does it mean to you when people tell you you inspire them? Is gosh, it... So let me... It, uh, when people say I inspire them, I kind of ask why. Um, because it always usually rubs me the wrong way because I growing up have, have always been told wow you're so inspiring and it was in the sense of you're so inspiring because you're really smart and you're disabled right and it always kind of alluded to like something with my disability um now i see if someone says that and i i ask them why and if it's something that i've accomplished or things like that i'm like yeah that's awesome thank you I don't actually really like using the word inspiring per se uh, because of those different connotations that as disabled people we know about and we get all the time. Uh, I still get to this day uh, people who are like, wow, Kristen, I don't know how you do it. Like just navigating a chair and blah, X, Y, Z. And it's like, wow, I don't have time for this conversation. Like I can tell you like, this is just how my human existence is. And I could talk to you about living in an ableist society. I could go there. Um, but then, you know, it also goes to, do I have the time and what outcome do I expect or want to happen? Because as we know, just because I have a conversation with someone doesn't mean that their mind is automatically going to change on a subconscious uh, stereotype that they've carried for a very long time. Uh, the word that I would rather use is empowering because I think based off of my personal experiences with the word inspiration, I see it as like an uplifting feeling but with no action. 
and instead I think empowering is like an uplifting feeling of something outside of you that you're seeing of the human spirit or a human form that you feel so uh, fired up that you are going to act in a way or, or act on different things that you usually wouldn't. And I think inspiration, uh, in my sense, that's where it lacks. Um, have I still used the word inspiring? Of course. I certainly talk slang here and there, too. Uh, but when uh, I, I really try to use the word empowering over inspiring. Mm -hmm. And also, I think another thing you were trying to say earlier is the intention of... Right and what exactly it is that they're inspired about. Right. Um, so an, along the same lines, another similar question is, what? how do you feel about being labeled disabled? Are you okay with that word um, to conceptualize uh, individuals with disabilities, uh, wheelchair users, etc.? If not, what is an alternative word that you would use? I'm totally fine with it. Disabled. It's a form of identity for me. I don't see it as a form of lacking anything. I really cringe when I hear people say like special, uh, specially abled or differently abled. Obviously handicapped. I don't like, um, if someone called me handicapped, um, I think the only time I, I use the word handicap is if I'm referencing a handicap bathroom stall. Um, I try to be mindful of the language that I use, but I say own the word. I mean, I don't. Ha I I personally don't have any problem with saying disabled, and I think the longer I dance around a word like disabled, the more it has power over me. Um, and to be honest, I don't see anything being wrong with being disabled. I think what's wrong is how disability is predominantly treated in our societies. That's a problem, not the word. So um, another question I had for you was um, moving on to, to travel. Now, I see that you've traveled to South Africa and met Kofi Annan, and you went to Bogota, Colombia for swimming. Where else have you traveled to that you've really enjoyed and felt that it was wheelchair accessible? I don't know about wheelchair accessible, but I, I went to Athens, Greece, and Mykonos, and different islands off of Greece. Um, I've been to Canada, and I've been to Mexico also. Uh, the most accessible place out of all the international places I've been is definitely Canada. Um, Quebec was great, Ottawa was great, Edmonton was great. Um, it was really accessible and clean also. Um, Greece in 2010, it was right before their economy crashed. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, just like a lot of cobblestone, and it wasn't that easy to get around because obviously uh, their structure is a bit older. Um, uh, South Africa was great. South Africa was beautiful. Uh, I have not seen, uh, a gorgeous sunset like I have ever seen there. Um, uh, about the accessibility though, off the top of my head, it, it wasn't that difficult as it was for Greece. Uh, Bovita, Colombia was my first international experience where um, I was seeing disabled people begging on the streets and that really hit me hard to a certain extent. Um, the accessibility for that wasn't that great either. Um, but the most accessible I would say is Canada. Yeah. Hmm. What resources would you like to see in terms of travel for people with disabilities? A standardized law that, which I know that, well, no, there are laws 
for planes, but uh, for the bathrooms to be accessible, like wheelchair accessible. Because it's, and I understand that planes are under certain space restrictions, but that is not inclusive at all. And especially when you're on a 12 hour plus flight, that's, that's not okay and that's not healthy. The other thing is I don't, I think that this would be great across the board, especially in regards to circulation uh, and those very long flights is for people and economy to be able to uh, extend a bit more, like lying down in a sense. And, and I know that that's a lot of logistics to think about, but I don't think that's healthy to try and sit for 12 plus hours when you're trying to sleep. And especially when you're disabled, that's not okay. That That's actually pretty bad. Um, our planes really need a whole new job to work on. It's, uh, I would say, infrastructure-wise, in regards to transit, planes, our, our whole plane system, specifically with the object itself, needs to be reworked. How would you, what, what would be your ideal plane structure? Well, um, yeah, I think... I think what you self movement aisle chair that would be very cool, um, or yeah, and and then also the bathrooms, right? Um, because if you're on such a long flight, you don't want to feel weirdly restricted that you can't go to the bathroom because it's not designed for you. That's not okay. Um, so I hope I I thought. I think I was wrong, but uh, Virgin Airlines is thinking of doing something like that, but I haven't heard anything since, and that was uh, roughly like a year ago. Um, so I I get frustrated over private sectors, um, not really thinking that the biggest minority population in the world is not a consumer group at all uh, for different ways or that they're too expensive uh, to accommodate disability needs. Uh, so that's, that's a whole other topic. Um, but those are some action items that I would certainly provide to, to airline companies. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then just like a last follow up here. What about car rentals or other kind of resources that would enable individuals with disabilities to be able to maneuver around more easily? I guess it depends what kind of disability you have because I think the standard hand controls. I know that the I know that car rentals uh, should have hand controlled cars available there, but I don't. I think the process to uh, being sure to rent one ahead of time is fairly difficult, which does not surprise me. Um, so I think you have to think about the. Uh, how many different variations of disabilities and uh, that you would want to have those opportunities. But also, that that's, that's the hard thing, I think, is what kind or what majority of disability do you want to accommodate or, like, spread your market to in that sense? And then from there... Uh, what other um, resources can you use to be fully inclusive that's not so cumbersome that that target audience is not using it? Um, yeah, so I think I think that's a wrap. And uh, thank you so much for coming on to our podcast. Um, thank you. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much.